Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Um, given that Will and, and um, Mark have already given a bit of an overview of the JDL and, and the team in general, I'm just going to jump straight into it. And I'm just going to give you three little case studies that we've been doing at Curtin uh, over the last year. And uh, you've seen this slide before, so I'm going to take you through two uranium lead dating methods, two slightly different ones, one sort of in situ method and one ex situ, if you like. Uh, and one relatively new technique, it's a very old technique, rubidium strontium dating, but it's something that we can now do in situ, and that's something that's been developed over the last couple of years. But broadly, my uh, my involvement really in the John DeLater Center is, is most things on the right-hand side, and, and I use a lot of the, the mineralogy, the automated mineralogy, and a lot of the, the sample preparation to get us to the stage where we are. And these are all sort of very much min minerals-related uh, projects, or mineral-focused projects. So the first one I'll run through, and I think I saw Nick in the audience here, um, is one uh, from Moho Resources. And uh, that's really looking at uh, your traditional zir zircon uranium lead projects. And uh, that's from Queensland. So the overall goal for these guys was to, to understand the age of the host rocks and understand the timing and mineralization. And were they coeval, were they not? Now we're still waiting on results for the, the mineralization side of things with using argon argon, but I can show you some of the stuff that, we can, that we've done with the host rocks. So we're sitting in the uh, the northwest of Queensland right here. So we're sitting uh, just off the off the edge of what they uh, they call the Georgetown block, underneath about average sort of 50 meters worth of cover. Now, one of the things we do just broadly in uranium lead is we um, we want to date various minerals. So we extract those by uh, by mounting grains or uh, crushing them up, or in our case, using a self frag, uh, grabbing those grains looking at them in various light modes to, to ensure that we are analyzing grains that are avoiding uh, inclusions, avoiding fractures, anything that can mobilize any sort of elements products. We want to get a nice clean signal. Uh, in this case we're using a laser ablation facility. Uh, Will said before it's, it's the laser ablation is probably the most efficient technique out there uh, but you need a slightly larger spot size, you have a deeper penetration depth so if you're in interested in something a bit more small you might want to go to shrimp, if you're interested in something even smaller than that uh, you're going to TIMS. But there's a trade-off for time efficiency. Um, just before I get into it, just to, so you're sort of aware of how, to, how we visualize this data, one of the most common ways is with a Concordia diagram, or this is an inverse Concordia diagram. Uh, and if you've, never, if you've never seen these before, the, the, the take-home point is that you want to have data that is lying on this Concordia curve, where your two isotopic systems of uranium and lead are in age agreement with each other. You can get a bit more complex signals where you can have discordant data that lay along a, a trajectory, and that could tell you something about when something crystallized and perhaps when something metamorphosed. Uh, what we can do then is we can take a whole cluster of these concordant grains and use the most precise of those techniques to calculate a weighted mean and age of something. Uh, and if you're sort of towards the younger end of the spectrum, you use uh, 206 lead and 238 uranium. If you're towards the older end, you tend to use 207 lead and 206 uh, lead as age. Um, for sedimentary rocks and meta sedimentary as well, you usually have a whole bunch of different grains, and so taking away the mean age doesn't really work. Uh, so one of the other things we look at is we look at probability density plots. Uh, so for example, in this example, you can see that you have about double the proportion of 2,000 million-year-old grains, and, and and sort of a, a subordinate proportion of 1,000 million-year-old ones. So these are some of those, those visualization techniques. Um, so with the Moho Resources project. Uh, we were quite interested to, to look at a whole bunch of different rock types. We looked at some granites, some volcanoclastic rocks, uh, some sediments. And all the granites themselves, so I've got these little, here's these big Concordia plots. And you can see most of the samples here plot right along there. And I've got a little zoom in inset on each of these that shows you that broadly the ages in these, if I if I take those those Concordia plots and convert those to weighted means, uh, you're getting ages of, of 1561, 1558, and 1559. But with... Uh, like anything, uncertainties that all seem to overlap with each other, and these pretty much overlap with the nearby. Uh, it's called the Esmeralda Super Suite. Um, so the conclusion is: look, they're probably a continuation under under cover of these Esmeralda Super Suite. We had some vol for kind of classic rocks and some dolerites. So same sort of thing again here. Now these were I'll, I'll add these were done by uh, a bit of Air Corps and a bit of RC, and not Diamond Drill. And so the the key issue there is contamination. So the granites themselves, in the previous slide, didn't really have, they only had the 1600 million year uh, age population. In these ones, on the other hand, volcanic, volcanic rocks that aren't as rich, if you like, in zircon grains themselves, 
tend to have quite a lot of these these and, and this one it's fine but in this one here you've got these little these uh, much younger grains that we assume have tumbled in either from the top or through sample contamination uh, on the surface uh, I wasn't there myself collecting them um, but diamond drill core wins but when in a pinch this can give you pretty reasonable results as well so while, when we just took the, the if you like the older population which we assumed was was uh, not affected um, and again we look at that at weighted means and lo and behold we get pretty much within uncertainty the same sort of ages uh, volcanics related much similar again for the to the Croydon volcanics that are a bit further east of them quite a simple uh, uh, explanation here uh, this is a sedimentary rock and you can see there's a lot of different zircon grains here uh, one of the things we don't do and this is quite important is we don't pre pick any zircon grains for sedimentary rocks because you'll be tempted to pick those nice looking zircon grains and you, you forego some of the, the cruddier looking ones and you might miss a whole population by just looking just looking at your nice beautiful grains so we literally just dump them all amount, mount them in resin and then willy nilly just blast them um, turns out here that wasn't a, bi a big issue um, we do get sort of two populations one sort of more uh, Permian age which again are probably from the overlying sediments but otherwise, broadly, we just get a single unimodal age with uh, essentially 1560, 1570, which seems to be related to either that Os Esmeralda super sweet or the Croydon volcanics, and one sort of hump of these these slightly older grains that we're not exactly sure where they come from at the moment. Um, so really, the conclusions from the first case study is that we've got granites of volcanics that are from about the same age. They're probably just to the east. And again, we're looking at doing some future argon-argon work to test the age of this mineralization to figure out is it does this also happen at 1560 is it much younger who, who knows um, cost for these sort of things is, is about 2500 per sample maybe slightly more if it's more complex and turnaround time as, as will mentioned the main caveat here is the booking of the system um, so if we know in advance you've got samples coming we can pre-book the system we can get things done quite quickly if we don't know, you know, starting a new project, it might take a little bit longer to get things done. I mean, certainly not a any of these geochron techniques are not, you know, your routine technique used by exploration explorationers. But it's it's something that if you've been craving to know what the age of something is for a while, here's your uh, here's where you come. Uh, so the second case study. Now this is again uranium lead, but this time we're looking in situ. We're not breaking up any of the rocks. We're looking uh, specifically, and this was a project we did with first quantum. Uh, looking at the Kernamona province in South Australia, so we're sitting somewhere here in the southwest uh, and uh, the southwest of um, the Kernamona province in the southeast of Australia. And one of the oops, sorry, so one of the things that was uh, again similar sort of question: what was the tectonic history? What was the mineralization history? Uh, this is a stratiform copper deposit, and we did these these to start with. We did TMA maps to try and characterize uh, what what this looked like. And I just want to highlight the, the images on the right here. And one of the things that we, we looked at was this, this yellow uh, pyrite and this sort of slightly darker yellow pyrotype. Seemed to be in association with this, this purple apatite and this, this brown titanite here. So we thought if we could date the titanite and date the, or, or the apatite, we could kind of, care, kind of figure out when that copper mineralization came in. Uh, there's another, another sample where we, we noticed there was sort of probably metamorphic monazite growing in the politic matrix there and again that probably gave us a timing of metamorphism you know were these coeval that did, did mineralization or was that coeval with with um, uh, mineralization so we looked at the titanite and again similar sort of thing and we, we titanite is notorious for having what I call common lead lead that crystallized at the time the uh, or it was incorporated in the crystal at the time it crystallized and so we tend to use only the the the, the youngest or the most concordant analysis. So all these sort of brown spots and, 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 and light colored spots are, are um, usually have appreciable amounts of common lead. Um, and broadly what we noticed is actually there was two different age populations. One we got at about 1610 and the other one at about 1580. Uh, now notice they're from two separate drill holes. They're from separate parts of this deposit. Um, and I'll go into what that might mean in a little bit. Um, we looked at monazite results and we looked at many different grains. They were all very complex grains that had big monazite cores with uh, sort of been variably eaten away by appetite and then little rings of alanite all around, around the outside. Tr truck full of inclusions as well. Um, so I'm just showing you one little example here. There was about six or seven odd grains in there and these little um, uh, near circular blobs are, are the laser ablation analyses. 
Uh, and if you take the ones that don't seem to intersect um, uh, fractures or inclusions, you, you get a, an age that's about 16, 15, 16, 10. It seems to be coeval with that first, uh, that older generation of titanite. So the kind of conclusions we have, and we're not exactly sure 100% what's going on, but that we have two distinct strata-bound mineralization events. Uh, we seem to have either titanite associated with uh, potentially charcoal pyrite at 1610 and titanite associated with pyrite at 1580. Or the alternative is that really we've got two spatial different ages. So in, in one side of the puzzle we've got something happening at 1610 and, and something later at 1580. We're not sure exactly what the answer is. We're still trying to figure this out more with first quantum um, you do with some further work. And for the monazite, it seems to be that the, the, the main metamorphism seemed to occur during this, this Olarian erogeny that occurred over there at about 1615. That was quite a, a simple conclusion there. And again, prices results roughly the same. It doesn't really matter whether you're crushing th something up or not. Some takes a bit. You can do in situ work is a bit slower because you physically have to move between to, to set your different spots. But on the other side, crushing things up is an extra step at the beginning of the process. So in the end, cost and time, it all kind of works out roughly the same. And the last case study I'll have here is, is something that we're, it's still confidential It'll uh, in terms of uh, where it is and, and who it's with, but in, in due time that will be made known. Um, but it's something, say, quite new. It's something that took us quite a few different months to actually get it to work, but we've, we think we finally got something reproducible and, and reliable. And the key problem here was that we, we had this, this, these samples with two distinct assemblages, um, both related to gold mineralization. And if I just focus on the image at the top here, you can see that you've got these nice, well, probably were euhedral biotite grains, which have been in, in areas sort of partly eaten away been, um, and breaking down into quartz and, and another uh, biotite sample. And then again, you can see the same thing in a, in a location like this. So we thought, could we date those different biotite generations? We can also date some of the other minerals in there uh, to see if those actually age generational differences and, and what that meant for exploration not just specifically where they were, but also in the wider belt. And what we noticed is that the biotite, the first generation, was variably reset. In some of these samples, particularly the one up here, uh, we seem to get an age of about 25, uh, 35, and that seemed to, to actually overlap with the argon argon age that was first published. But the more surprising thing was that when we looked at the second generation, we got a completely different age, this recrystallized biotite date. And that seemed to be the same in, in most of the samples that we dated, at about 12, 1210, essentially. So we seemed to have two completely different age populations. And this wouldn't have been possible previously because you need that textual control. If you try to crush the sample up and do solution rubidium strontium or argon argon, first, A, you're only going to pick that euhedral um, biotite, and so you're going to get an age of 2500-ish. Uh, but you're going to miss that, that crummy looking recrystallized stuff. And that, that is really important because in some of these satellite deposits that are around this, this main area, all they have is seemingly that second event. Uh, we can get similar results from the Muscovite and, and Fengite that were also around, but it's slightly more scattered. And really, so the conclusions from this study is, again, the paragenetic sequence suggested was these two assemblages, the first at 2530, the second at 1210. Uh, and importantly, for gold-wise, in, in, their, in their more regional exploration, that they only seem to have evidence for this mesoproterozoic event. Uh, this is slightly more expensive than, than the uranium lead, mainly because it, it tends to be quite a complex thing, and we're still sort of in the early development stages, but this might have been the only solution for, um, for this particular company. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. One, but no. Real, realistically, I like to sort of have half a dozen for your your average project. Mainly, part of our, our our money comes from you guys, but part of my credit as well comes from actually disseminating this work. So we take both commercial projects. Uh, Luke Forty can attest you pay a premium for them, um, but there's no publications involved, or you can do research projects where, which are about. 40, well, th those, th that bit of money that you saw up there, that's purely for research projects. Add an extra two and a half times for purely commercial projects, but all is then vowed in secrecy. It will not be spoken about. <laughs>